beyond UFOs. That, that phrase has many possible meanings. <laughs> what, what's the meaning that you favor? Uh, the meaning that I favor when I'm talking about it is I'm going beyond looking at UFOs, and what's beyond that to me, beyond that is looking at the hard science of how do we actually search for life on other worlds. And could that involve the, the, the popular notion that Earth is being visited by someone? When you say the hard science. Well, certainly, as, as I go through in, in a fair amount of detail, I personally think that the evidence is pointing in the direction that, to me, it seems very, very likely that there are aliens and alien civilizations quite capable of being here and visiting us. Now, I distinguish that from looking at the UFOs because I haven't seen anything that, to me, um, qualifies as our standard form of science. Now, I'm not saying that these things aren't real. What I'm saying is that we can't study them the way we do normal science. And so I, and I think that the normal science is still pointing us in the direction of seeing the same kinds of things. And yet, there are scientists there are military pilots, there are commercial airline pilots, there are, there are law enforcement officers, there, there are other members of the military who, who come out with reports of things that they have seen that they can't explain, and they're not necessarily saying it's from another planet or now physicists are talking about other dimensions, but, but there, there does seem to be uh, an accumulation of, of material that indicates that there's something going on that we're not sure exactly what it is because not every UFO has been explained. Correct, and so UFO is, a, is an interesting term, right? It stands for unidentified flying object. So from that standpoint, there is absolutely no doubt that UFOs exist because there are many, many things that have been seen that are not identified. The question, though, is, is what are they? And at this point, scientifically, we don't really have a way to address that because the problem is in, is in science, we have to look for something that if you say, I saw this, that's great, but we have to say, where's the hard proof that somebody else can look at also? An eyewitness report by itself is never enough. I prefer the ones by military pilots or commercial pilots or the commercial pilot reports who they don't like talking about the things that they think just kind of buzz their airliner. They don't want to report it. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, there's you know, career possibilities, things that could happen to them, but they're still seeing things that they can't understand. So how do we account for that? Well, it, I, I'm not doubting that they've seen things that, that they didn't understand. There's no question about that. What I'm saying is, scientifically, that does not give us enough to draw a conclusion. And so there's nothing wrong with looking at that and trying to see if there's you know, somewhere in there some evidence that we can collect. And I encourage people who want to do that to do that. What I'm saying is that there's another way to approach this topic, which is through the standard scientific approach of going out, going to other worlds, studying these other worlds with telescopes, studying them with thin, you know, real data that everyone can look at together. And those things are turning up incredible things. I mean, just this year, we now, for the first time, have evidence that there are billions of Earth-like planets yeah. in this galaxy. And so there's nothing wrong with the, looking at the UFOs. I'm just not convinced it's going to get us anywhere, whereas we have this other way that is getting us somewhere and may answer the question and very likely answer it long before the other way does. If I, if I was wearing a hat, I would tip it in tribute to Kepler. It's an amazing, was an amazing mission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there's still so much more data that it still has to go through. But, so do you know at this point, um, what is the final count or, or the current count of planets uh, uh, that actually were uncovered or discovered by Kepler? Well, the Kepler count is, is somewhere over 3,000 now. But you have to remember, Kepler is a statistical mission. We're looking for transits where a planet goes in front of a star. That is only possible if the planetary system happens to be aligned just right, right? If the planet's going like this, you're not going to see anything, right? Or uh. like this. It's only if it's like this. So statistically, what Kepler has done is you would only expect a planet to do that in, you know, one out of hundreds of 
cases. So Kepler picked one spot in the sky, looked at about 100,000 stars searching for these things, and based on how many it finds, you can then statistically say, okay, there must be this many more because this was a random sample. So the real key is Kepler has shown us that minimum of about a quarter of all stars have planetary systems. And most, most likely, by the time we get through all the data, that number, I won't be surprised if it rises over 90%. Conservative astronomers, scientists, probably the whole, the whole group at SETI, uh, they would say, no, we need to use, uh, we need to be looking for signals, or we need to be sending signals and looking for some kind of a response. And yet, so many people are saying that these things are landing in their backyards. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and these are not necessarily crazy people, uh, especially the people right. who say they see something and it even leaves marks on the ground and they see the thing take off. It's hard to get around that. Well, you know, as I go through um, in some detail in the book and in my talk that I did today, you, you can look at the distances between stars, compare that to what we can do today going to the moon. And just real brief, uh, to scale, aliens the distance to the nearest star, if you use the scale model that I use for my model solar systems, like the Voyage model in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., that's outside the National Air and Space Museum, the sun's about this big. Earth is smaller than that, right. 15 meters away. The moon is this far from Earth. And the nearest star is across the United States. So what you conclude is that if aliens are visiting us, their technology has to be incredibly far beyond Ours. Not like 50 years or 500 years, but like 50,000 years beyond ours. And I always fall back on Arthur C. Clarke's famous line, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So do I think aliens are visiting us? Actually, I think probably they are. However, I, what I can say from looking at that scale argument is their technology has to be so advanced that to me, if they don't want us to know they're here, right. we won't. In the scheme of things, if you consider where we are, how old we are as a species, compared to someone else who might only be a thousand years ahead of us uh, technologically, it's not inconceivable that they could have figured out a way how, how to not use fossil fuels to propel themselves uh, halfway across the galaxy. Uh, they, they could have figured out a, a way to do it in a more efficient way. Uh, I, I, I certainly think that, that if we survive, we will find ways to travel among the stars and colonize the galaxy. It may take a long time, but if we survive, we will do it. And therefore, it seems very likely that someone else would have also. There's an interesting race going on. It's the race in science for the search for uh, microbial organisms versus the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, two separate kind of uh, uh, items. Uh, who's winning the race? How are we doing with that? Well, you know, it, it's an interesting race in, in that sense. Yes, there is SETI, but, but SETI is kind of like the, um, you know, it's a hit or miss. If it hits, you don't know when it's going to hit, and, and it'll be conclusive. Um, whereas the other approach, the looking for the microbes on Mars and so on, is proceeding in a very systematic way. So what we can say is, if we keep doing what we're doing, if we keep funding our space program, in 50 years, we will know if there was ever life on Mars. We can't say whether SETI will have a success in 50 years or not. Uh, and I know there, there are some scientists who are concerned that funding may run out, that, that SETI you know, won't last long enough to be part of that whole discovery process. Well, SETI is entirely privately funded because of a uh, fairly dumb decision made by Congress about 20 years ago. Um, it ought to be funded, I think, you know, with government funds, just like other research. But that's beside the point. Yes, it's relying on private funding. Whether that's more or less reliable than government funding, of course, remains to be seen, since our government doesn't seem to be doing a very good job of funding things. When you, were, when you were growing up, uh, what were your feelings back then of you know, flying saucers? You probably saw all the same 
black and white movies that I did growing up, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, the Thing from Another World. Did any of this have any uh, impact on, on your career choices? But at, at, at one point, did you believe that there were aliens and flying saucers, or did you never believe Oh, absolutely. That? In fact, um, as I tell the story in the beginning of my book, I was totally convinced that I was being visited by very tiny aliens when I was a child. And, and the only reason I'm no longer convinced is because now I can see alternative possibilities to what my brain was doing that made me think that I was being visited by aliens. If we do discover, if, if the discovery does happen in our lifetimes or in someone else's lifetime of an ancient or a continuing civilization, intelligent civilization, either at our, our level or beyond our level, what would be the implication to us here on Earth? I think it's a very good question, and of course, it's hard to know exactly what it would mean to us. But to me, uh, you know, the subtitle of my book is The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence and its Astonishing Implications to Our Future. And the reason I think the implications are so astonishing is because no matter what the answer is, you find learning our place relative to other possible species is a, is a key thing. And in particular, what you find when you analyze this question is that whether or not we're being visited, probably, just as Frank Drake said a long time ago, right. comes down to the question of can species survive? We reach a point in our technology where we are today, where we're on the verge of having the technology that will allow us to begin to move out into space, but that same technology gives us the power to wipe out our civilization. And so the question is, can we get past this point? And we don't know. We don't know if others have. If we got a signal from someone else, that would essentially tell us, you know what? It's possible. You can get past this bottleneck of history and make it into a future. And I think just knowing that someone else has done it would make it easier for us to survive and solve our problems as well. And presumably, they've got their own little Goldilocks zone <laughs> that they're in orbit around, right? Presumably, <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. A pleasure.